Thank you all. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to speak to you all about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I thank the Mentoring Partnership, the Applied Research Collaborative, the Center for Youth Development, and PBBS at Twin Cities, who've all come together to create this event and the series, which I think is really important for the work that we're all doing with youth. You know, a lot of people seem really excited to talk about diversity issues and mentoring, and the reality is that the mentoring field is actually pretty uh, young. And the main question that researchers have been trying to answer is, does mentoring work? And now they're starting to ask, under what situations, when does it work, and for whom? And most recently, researchers have started to ask about diversity issues, such as race, ethnicity, um, and gender. And there's very little research on this topic. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to be drawing from research in other areas and applying it to youth-adult relationships. And I will discuss a little bit about some research that I have been able to do and some work that I've been collaborating with a colleague in Chicago where we've been trying to make a program culturally and developmentally and gender specific for um, girls in Chicago. The title of the presentation, Mentoring Ain't One Size Fits All, so the reality is, you know, a lot of times when we get into mentoring and when, when, uh, when people think about mentoring, they think about this one-on-one -on -one relationship and you might have a conceptualization of what this relationship should look like, but the reality is that when we bring youth from different contexts and mentors from different contexts, sometimes what we might intend to do might not necessarily fit with the communities we're working with. And, you know, I'll talk about some of the race, ethnicity issues and some of the other diversity issues. And of course, all the work that I've done has never been done in isolation. There have been a number of students who worked with me over the years who've helped me um, in some of the research that I'm going to be presenting today. And also, I've had a number of mentors myself who've also helped me um, in thinking about my work. So what I'm going to talk about primarily is race, ethnicity, and culture issues and mentoring. But I will discuss a little bit about gender and development. So I know in the reading that you got for today, we talk about race, ethnicity, and culture, gender, and development. I'll, I'll focus more on the race, ethnicity, and culture, but I will mention in the end, talk a little bit about some of the research on gender and development and how um, we can apply it to youth mentoring. So I wanted to start off by looking at a case study of um, a young girl in a mentoring relationship. Anna is a 16-year-old Latina who lives in Chicago. Her parents immigrated to the U.S. from El Salvador for, for economic opportunities and to provide their children with a better life. Her mom decides to put her in a mentoring program because Anna has been misbehaving at school. Anna is matched up with Ellen, a middle-class white woman who lives in the suburbs and is a lawyer. During one of their outings, Anna and Ellen talk about college. When Ellen asks her where she wants to go to school, Anna names some local colleges. Ellen tells her that she should think about going to school out of state so she can learn to be independent. Anna doesn't think her parents will be okay with that. Ellen then states that it's really important that Anna fulfills her dreams and not worry too much about her parents. So, okay. So I see you guys laughing. So, so what, are some pop, what are some cultural values that are being displayed here? You can call it out. OK, white privilege. What else? Independence. independence. So we see the, in, the value for independence in Ellen. Family. So for Anna, you know, her value for family. So she's kind of hesitant. You know, I don't know what my parents are going to say about that. And then what are some potential conflicts that might occur because of these different values that we see being displayed here. Okay, so there might be some conflict, you know, in the relationship itself. So Ellen is giving her advice about where she should go to school and, you know, Ellen has very good intentions, you know, she's trying to help, you know, she wants her to maybe think, you know, um, beyond her horizons of what she's been envisioning for her future. Uh, but then, you know, let's imagine she goes home and says, you know, Ellen thinks that I should go to school, you know, in Minnesota instead. Her parents will say, what? Are you crazy? You're not leaving us, you know. And um, potentially, you know, maybe the family might, might see Ellen as breaking up, trying to break up the family, even though that's not what Ellen is trying to do. 
Um, or maybe Anna might feel uncomfortable about talking about certain things with Ellen because she might be afraid of, maybe she's going to give her advice that might make her uncomfortable, you know, with her parents. So there are so many things here that might be playing a role that could, could potentially cause a conflict, even though Ellen has very good intentions, you know, in the relationship. So it's really important to think about, you know, what are some of the cultural values of the child or of the family and the values of the mentor and where might there be a mismatch, you know, in those values and, and which could potentially affect the relationship. So those are the kinds of things that I want us to think about today in, in youth mentoring. So, why um, look at diversity issues and mentoring relationships? So the needs and characteristics of youth, they vary, you know, so as we see for Anna, her values and her family's values, you know, they are different from her mentors. The youth, they shape their relationships with their mentors, so they're active agents um, in their relationships, and then their characteristics can shape the relationships. And then finally, mentors become a part of youth's social network. So. So now, the, um, as active agents, the youth are, in a sense, bringing this mentor into their life, and there's this whole social network that they're already a part of, so mentors can potentially impact other individuals in their network and their environment. So here we have two individuals who have two different social networks coming together, and the, the different characteristics um, need to be considered in, in providing the best you know, services for youth start off by talking specifically about race, ethnicity, and culture. Now, um, when researchers have looked at race, the question that they have been asking, and um, Gloria mentioned this um, when, she, when she came up here and welcomed you all, is cross-race more effective or same-race relationships more effective? So that's been what researchers have asked first. That's been the first question. Now, if you look at most of the work that I've done actually um, is on informal mentoring and the work that other people have done on informal mentoring as well, we find that youth in informal mentoring relationships tend to name people of the same race. And that makes sense because they're naming people from their community. Now, in volunteer mentoring programs, one of the things that might happen in some programs is that you're gonna get whoever you can and oftentimes there's going to be people of a different race who are working with youth. And one of the things that researchers have started to ask is, you know, is there one type of relationship that's more effective? Is it, you know, important that we match our youth with someone of the same race? And there have been um, different arguments about why same race mentoring would be more effective. And then also there's arguments about why cross-race mentoring would be effective. The proponents of same-race mentoring, they talk about how um, when you're working with youth of color, they, they might internalize some of the racist attitudes that our society might have about their group, so they might be vulnerable to low self-esteem. So it's important that we match them then with mentors who are of the same background, who can be positive role models and advocates and teach them how to deal with some of these conflicts that they might be dealing with because of racism. And then there's proponents of cross-race mentoring. So proponents of cross-race mentoring say, you know what, the race of the mentor is not as important as the skills of the mentor, the experience, their openness to the culture, their interests, that we have to look at similarity along other levels and that that's more important than the race. And some of these proponents of cross-race mentoring say that some youth, and if we look at some of the volunteer mentoring programs, um, in some of the urban areas, they tend to have many youth of color in these programs. And they say if we try to match them up with someone of the same race, some of them might be on a waiting list for a long time because we, it's always hard to find people of the same exact race or culture to, um, to work with these youth. So some people say that instead of having them wait until we find someone from their community, that we should just match them up with an adult who's interested, no matter what the race, and be able to provide them with support rather than not give them a mentor at all. Now, the research in this area, what's interesting is that it's really mixed. So some of the findings are favorable towards cross-race mentoring relationships, some of the findings are favorable towards same-race mentoring relationships, and some of the of researchers find that there's no difference between cross- and same-race relationships. So 
We still don't know, you know, which kind of relationship is more effective. But the question you know, that I ask and others have asked is, are we asking and looking at the right racial factors? Simply looking at the race of an individual is not enough to see whether or not these relationships are going to be effective. We all know that you can match two, a, a youth and an adult of the same race, but they might be of different cultures. It doesn't mean same race or does not necessarily mean cultural understanding. So perhaps you have um, a black youth and a black adult who are matched up, but maybe the youth, um, his parents are from Ethiopia and the adult um, is African American. There's big cultural differences there. Or let's say we have, or maybe the youth you know, could also be black, but they're actually Latino as well. So maybe the families from Puerto Rico and they're black Puerto Ricans. And that's and another cultural difference. Or we could match up a Latino youth with a Latino adult, and in Chicago, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, there's a lot of rivalry between the two, and also there's huge differences between um, the two cultures. And uh, my family's from the Dominican Republic, and I'm from New York, and for me, it was in some ways a culture shock moving to Chicago because I'd never been around Mexicans, and I made an assumption growing up that Latinos were all similar, and I realized we weren't. So I saw there were a lot of cultural differences, and, um, and I felt in some ways at a loss, wasn't really sure about how I fit in in Chicago. So I think the same thing would happen with um, relationships you know, with youth and mentors. So we can't make assumptions that both individuals are going to understand each other if they're similar racially or culturally. I think it's important that we look at what are some of the cultural processes that are underlying some of these relationships. So I'm going to get at some of that later, talk about things like ethnic identity or cultural mistrust. And there is one um, set of researchers who did look at other dimensions besides race and ethnicity. What they did in this study, and Sharon Murphy, they looked at um, a, it was an internship program for high school students and they randomly assigned them to either same race relationships or different race relationships. And they found that those who were in racially similar relationships, that was related to them liking their mentor more and getting more support, but it wasn't necessarily related to their satisfaction in the relationship or whether or not they thought the relationship would continue. What actually was related to the satisfaction and whether or not they thought the relationship would continue was the similarity in outlooks, in their values, and their interests. So it seemed that similarity in some of these other dimensions seemed to be really important. Now I'd like to talk about what are some cultural factors that we need to consider when we're working with youth so that we're not looking at just someone's skin color or someone's race. So looking beyond and looking deeply at some of these issues. Ethnic identity is something that would be really important. It may be that, um, that an individual from a particular culture highly identifies with that culture or they don't highly identify with that culture. So, so if we, you know, we do same race matching, you know, will the youth, will that even make a difference for the youth if they don't really identify? There was one study that was done with black undergraduate women in a predominantly white university, and they found that those who had strong ethnic identities tended to um, name black role models. So perhaps those with stronger identities, race would be more important for those um, in those relationships. Another factor that's important to consider is stereotype threat. This is a psychological state that an individual experiences when some property of the environment reminds you of the stereotypes held by society. So sometimes people succumb to, that stere to the stereotype or the expectations if they are reminded of the stereotype. So in terms of youth-adult relationships or youth-mentoring relationships, Maybe a mentor might unwittingly say something that might remind the young person about a stereotype about their group and then cause this threat and might influence them in, let's say, a performance on an exam or something. That's where stereotype, stereotype threat has mostly been looked at in terms of um, per academic performance. Another factor that's really important to consider is cultural mistrust. This is a pervasive attitude that racial minority individuals might have towards European Americans because of historical discrimination and oppression in the U.S. And researchers have mostly looked at this in 
therapist-client relationships among African Americans. And what researchers have found is that those who have higher levels of cultural mistrust are more likely to terminate their relationships with their therapist. When it comes to mentoring, there was one study done where mentoring relationships were simulated. And they found that African American college students cultural mistrust influenced their perception of their mentors, particularly their cultural competence. So those who had the highest levels of cultural mistrust thought that an African-American mentor was more culturally competent than a European-American mentor. So if the implication for mentoring is if a youth has cultural mistrust, that could potentially impact the development of the relationship. They might not feel comfortable getting close to that person. It might take longer for them to develop a relationship. And the key to mentoring relationships is that trust and rapport. And without that trust and rapport, mentors can't make a difference. So that's something to consider in mentoring relationships. Also, the cultural sensitivity of the mentor is really important. So um, the openness of that, of that individual to another's culture. And you know, I know that there's been work here done on culturally responsiveness you know, of staff who are working with, with youth. And it's really important to think about how can we make people more culturally sensitive. And I've been collaborating with a colleague of mine in Chicago, David Dubois, who I understand came here and spoke to you all last year. And we've been collecting some data on African-American and Latina girls who are matched up with adult mentors. And half of their mentors are white and middle class, but then the other mentors are also middle class, but of other races, ethnicities. But we asked, we asked the youth, we gave them a scale about had them rate their mentors' cultural sensitivity. And those who reported their mentors as being more culturally sensitive, they found that they felt that they were more connected to them. So the cultural sensitivity, you know, despite no matter what the race is, seems to be important in being able for the youth to feel connected to that adult. One of the things I know people are interested in too, and here in Minneapolis is a growing immigrant population is what are the things that we need to be sensitive to when working with immigrant youth and trying to pair mentors up with youth. It's important that mentors become aware of the stressors that immigrant youth are experiencing. Um, it, there are stressors related to exclusion. I'm sure here in Minneapolis, as in Chicago and all over the US, there's been a growing anti-immigrant wave and it's caused a lot of stressors for families and some families are not necessarily seeking services because they're afraid that um, they're not going to be accepted or if they're undocumented that they will be reported. So this causes more stressors for these families. There's stressors related to poverty. So many of these immigrant families are moving into neighborhoods where there is poverty. And along with poverty comes many other stressors, whether it's overcrowded schools, segregated schools. And these stressors related to poverty can cause psychological conflicts in the youth. In many immigrant families, too, that I see in Chicago, separation is a huge issue. So many youth have dealt with separation issues within their family. Maybe their parents came to the U.S. first and left them behind so they can um, you know, get stabilized here in the U.S. or maybe they were only able to get you know, one person to go. So maybe the parents leave and then the, parents, the children stay behind with an extended family. So now the young person is dealing with the separation of... Um, between the parent and themselves, and then maybe it's five, six years go by, and then the child has now grown attached to this extended family member that they're staying with, and then they're asked, now they can go back, now they can come to the U.S. and be reunited with the family. Now they're gonna be separated again from someone who they're close to, an extended family member, and then now they're reunited with the parents and trying to form this relationship and trying to figure out well, what is this parent-child relationship. So in a way, the parent and child has to re get to know each other. So there's a lot of stressors related to that. And I think that that's important for mentoring because in mentoring, one of the things that mentors also need to be careful about is when we don't have that, those consistent inter and frequent interaction, it could potentially, and if we don't necessarily fulfill our promises to youth, these youth might be extra vulnerable to unfulfilled promises because they feel like, well, I've been abandoned before. I won't be surprised if I've been abandoned again, you know, by another adult. So, so for these youth, you know, they're extra sensitive about, um, about adults and how, you know, whether or not they follow through. 
Also, there's strain in parent-child relationships in immigrant families. Um, for those of you who work with immigrant families here in Minneapolis, you're probably familiar that many children, they acculturate faster than the parents, and the parents are freaking out because they feel like their children are going to get eaten up by American culture, or they're, they're, they're not interested or don't care about their family's culture anymore. The language, children learn the language much more quickly than the parents. Sometimes the parent-child relationship, the power changes because the child knows more English than the parent, and that can change the dynamics in the relationship. And also the parent relies a lot more on the children. They have a lot of responsibilities in terms of translating. So there's so many stressors that um, people need to become aware of when they're working with youth, and particularly mentors, to understand what are some of the needs that these youth might have. And finally, in the case study that I brought up earlier, you know, many of you mentioned um, you know, the, the family values that Anna might have. So, so here in the U.S., the, mo the more dominant value in mainstream white middle-class culture is individualism, where the needs of the individual is more important than the, than the group. And collectivism is the opposite, where the needs of the group is more important than the individual. Now, there aren't individuals who are purely individualistic or purely collectivistic. Usually within a culture, you see a range in terms of individualism or collectivism. So we can't always um, put someone as a purely individualistic or collectivist person. And then also, you know, especially with immigrant families, the child's values might be changing. So over time, you know, as they get older, they might be, want to become more individualistic because they've been acculturate, acculturating to U.S. society, but that conflicts, you know, with the family. And familism is a related value to collectivism. Here, the emphasis is on the immediate and extended family. So in many cultures, this is an important value, and the needs of the family are much more important than the needs of the individual. So sometimes decisions are made based on what the family needs rather than what an individual needs. So these kinds of values are important to consider in terms of when working with families and mentors are working with youth to figure out, well, what are their cultural values and what's important to them? What motivates them? Is it the family or is it individualistic goals? And then that'll um, help you in figuring out what is, what's appropriate advice in giving to youth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that's relevant in mentoring to some of these cultural issues. People um, have looked at informal mentoring relationships so, and have asked, well, who do youth typically identify as mentors? So as I mentioned, usually youth identify people from their communities. An interesting finding when you look at, here's one study with white college students, they tended to identify both relative, relatives and non-relatives. But the research that's been done on Latino and African American youth, they tend to identify mostly relatives. So maybe that's reflective of some of the values for familism or communalism. And in African American families, there's a lot of um, uh, importance to the extended family. So maybe these findings are reflective of some of the cultures, of the cultures. Also, um, Another thing I just thought of too, related to this, is sometimes class, you know, can also affect all this. So everything's always a lot more complicated. And maybe, you know, depending on their communities, maybe they only have access to maybe people in their family and they don't necessarily have access to people outside of their, their families and developing relationships with people in the institutions. There was one study um, that my research team and I did with Latino youth, and we looked at their informal mentoring relationships. And this is with 12th grade, college, um, 12th grade students at a Chicago public high school. And they were ethnically diverse, and the majority of them came from immigrant families. So either the, the young person immigrated themselves, or they were born in the U.S. and their parents immigrated here. And what was interesting um, in this study, what we did that was a little bit different from other studies is usually when people ask about mentoring relationships, people ask about one mentor. So people assume, researchers have assumed that there's one mentoring relationship in a person's life. And in some ways, I think that this is reflective of our individualistic values in the U.S. Perhaps people have multiple mentoring relationships. We don't necessarily look at, you know, give youth the opportunity to identify more than one. And what I found in this study is that a little over half 
identified at least one mentor in their life, and 39% identified two or, two or three mentors. So we gave them the opportunity to name up to three individuals in their life who's a mentor. And the other interesting thing that's you know, consistent with some of the values for familism is that the majority of these youth mentors were family members. Either they were older siblings or they were extended family, such as an aunt or uncle, a cousin, or a grandparent. And then there was a minority of the mentors who were non-familial adults. So it might be a teacher or a counselor at a school, a pastor, or maybe um, an adult in a community, a neighbor. So those were the individuals who were named. And I think when working with Latino families, it's important to think about the role that family members play. Oftentimes, a lot of the research that I've done has been on academic achievement of Latino youth. And what I have found is that the families are usually very supportive of, these, of their children. Emotion, they're very supportive emotionally. They want them to do well. They encourage them. But there's limitations to their role. So, Many of these youth, they're the first in their families to possibly graduate from high school and go on to college. The families, their educational levels might be you know, less than a high school degree. Maybe they just went to elementary school. And even though they're emotionally supportive, they can't necessarily tell them what to do. So that's where some of the limitations come in. And I did a study one time with youth and with Latino youth and asked them about individuals in their life who were supportive, including parents. And this is a quote from a parent that shows some of the limitations that they might have in being able to help their children. And I think this is reflective of maybe what some other familial mentors might um, not be able to do, whether it's an aunt or uncle. So this parent was having problems with his son. He wasn't doing well when he was in eighth grade, and he was telling me a story about when, he was in eight, when the child was in eighth grade, he was having problems in class and problems with math in particular. And he said, my son had to go to his room and go study. For a couple months, I kept him there. I said, you go study, but I can't help you because I don't know what to do. I went to talk to his counselor, and they helped. And he, ta he told me that his son's mathematical skills surpassed his own, so he couldn't teach him how to do well, you know, tutor him in his, for his math class where he was struggling. But this parent, you know, took the initiative to reach out and talk to a counselor to get the support that he needed. And even though this is a parent, some of the mentors, when we've done research on the informal mentoring relationships, as I mentioned, many of them are extended family. When we've looked at the educational levels of the extended family, they they were relatively lower compared to the non-familial mentors. So, so they, these family mentors were very supportive emotionally, but they couldn't necessarily give them the information or specific support that these youth needed. Also, I was, we were interested in looking at the number of mentors. So in mentoring, usually we just look at whether or not you have a mentor. So we just ask about one. And is there a difference between those youth who have mentors and those who don't? But because we asked about multiple mentoring relationships to try to capture that collectivist kind of mindset, we were interested in seeing if the number of mentors were related to any academic outcomes. And we found that the more mentors youth named the lower absenteeism rates they had. They also had greater educational expectations and they had a greater sense of school belonging. So it seems that having these multiple, and we also found that you know, even if you just had one mentor, we could we see some of these differences, but having multiple mentoring relationships seem to reinforce some of these messages that um, individuals are trying to transmit. And maybe multiple individuals can monitor youth's behavior better than just one person. What a limitation to the study is that we didn't ask if the mentors all knew each other. So it would have been interesting to see whether or not these mentors had relationships, because if they did and they interacted, then that means they were probably able to reinforce the messages that they were trying to deliver to these young people. And a question that people have asked me in our research is, well, is there a difference between non-familial and familial mentoring relationships in terms of the outcomes? As I mentioned before, the difference between the two is that the non-familial mentors are more highly educated than the familial mentoring relationships. And what we have found is that those who have non-familial mentors, 
they tend to, and only have non-familial mentors, they tend to um, have higher educational expectations and expectancies for success compared to those who don't have mentoring relationships. So when we added uh, those who had only familial mentoring relationships, we didn't see a difference um, at all. And then we found that having either a non-familial mentor or a familial mentor made a difference in the sense of school belonging when we compared them to those who didn't have a mentoring relationship. So somehow these relationships that they have with these mentors, whether they're in or outside the school system, is transmitting to a sense of general support within the school environment and the students feel like they belong and they're a part of and they fit in to school. Okay. I wanted to give you a couple examples of culturally specific mentoring programs to, to show you what some people have tried to do to make their programs culturally relevant. There's one uh, project called the Cross-Cultural Mentoring Project, and this is a program that targets Native American youth ages 11 to 15. And in this program, um, they published this study in 2000, the mentors were all European American graduate students. And what they did to make the mentors more culturally sensitive is that they provided cultural, uh, Native American cultural consultants to the program who taught the mentors about the, um, the cultures of these Native American uh, youth and their families and their history. The mentors, uh, being part of the program, they were expected to do research on the history and the, the, the tribal histories of the youth they were working with. And they also had to attend local cultural events with the mentees. And on top of it, they also had to examine their own cultural biases. So in general, when you're trying to be culturally responsive or sensitive towards youth, it's really hard to understand another culture if we don't know our own culture and not aware of our own biases. So that's usually a first step in trying to be culturally sensitive. Another, an example of another culturally specific mentoring program is a therapeutic group mentoring model which, is, which targets African American males in foster care. And in this program, this was different in that it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationship. They used a group mentoring approach. So they had adults work with a, a number of youth at once. And what they tried to do is foster a sense of community where participants had a responsibility towards the group rather than their own needs. And they also tried to integrate values that they thought were relevant to, these communi to this community. So things like group above self, the respect for self and others, responsibility for self and community, reciprocity, and authenticity. So they tried to integrate these values within the program to make it more culturally sensitive for the youth. And a program that I've been collaborating with um, at UI, at Chicago, I've been collaborating with David Dubois, who's at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and we've been doing some work with Big Brothers Big Sisters there. And what we did is we developed a structured program for Big Sisters and Little Sisters. And the Little Sisters tend to be African American and Latina girls, um, ages about uh, 10 to 13. And the mentors, they all vary, mostly middle-class professional women, about half are white and the other half are of different race ethnicities. And we've tried to make this program culturally relevant to these girls. And one of the things that we do besides weaving in culturally relevant themes throughout the program, these, these girls, they meet with their mentors once a month in a series of workshops over a year and a half. And in between, the mentors and youth are expected to get together on their own, so in an unstructured format. So the big, the big and the little gets together outside of that. And um, one of the things we do early on in, the, in this program, it's called, the program is called Girl Power. And in this program, one of the things we try to do early on is we have a workshop that's about culture to get them to start thinking early on about the cultural background of the youth and the cultural background of the mentor and so that they can start getting to know each other at that level. And this workshop, we call it Celebrating Our Sameness and Our Differences, Cultural Diversity. And our goals in this workshop is to help the girls develop a positive ethnic and racial identity, 
We also help the mentors and girls share their cultural backgrounds with one another. And we help the girls learn strategies for coping with prejudice and discrimination. So we can't solve all these things all at once in one day in three hours, but we touch on each of those topics. And one of the things we do too with this intervention is that we provide them with activities that they can do outside of the workshop so they can continue the conversation. So they're expected to get together on their own in between the workshops and we give them ideas of things that they do together to be able to continue talking about whatever was discussed at the last, at the last workshop. And some of the sample activities that we give them choices of a number of activities they could do on their own. And one of the things that we, one of the activities we suggest, and they can choose whatever they want to do. Um, we call this one, She is Powerful. So we have the girls, with the assistance of their mentor, identify positive role models from their culture, whether it's someone they know in their community or in their family or someone in the media. And, the, and if the young person identifies someone who isn't necessarily, you know, in the, in the media who isn't a good role model, the mentor tries to help them identify a positive role model. And they're supposed to explore what makes this person a positive role model and how can this um, how can the girl become a positive role model herself in the future? Another example of an activity that we suggest is to explore the discrimination and prejudice is to watch a movie where there is uh, discrimination and prejudice going on with a particular group. So we give them a list of movies that are rated PG that they can watch. So examples might be Remember the Titans or Rabbit Proof Fence. And then we give them a list of questions that the mentors can use in helping them have a conversation afterwards about what happened in the movie, how did they understand the discrimination, how did the characters cope with it, have you ever dealt with anything like this in your, um, in your life as well. And as I mentioned, before they do this on their own, in the workshop we explore all of these issues. And, and in the workshop itself, it's very interactive to make it developmentally appropriate. The girls you know, really want it to be fun, so we want to teach them something, but it has to be fun so that they'll listen and take, take something away with it. Um, during the workshop, we introduce the idea of culture. What is culture? It's such a broad term. It means so many different things. We also have them, in the beginning of the workshop, do a skit um, where there's a mentor and youth in the skit and they explore an area of difference and then the girls and the mentors together talk about what this area of difference is and how they could resolve it. Then uh, we also have bring in a community presenter who talks about culture and they could, the, usually the community presenter does it however it, they would like to do it. We also have them do an art project where they start where the mentor and the youth gets to know each other on, in terms of their culture and tries to learn a little bit about their culture. And we also you know, have them explore prejudice and discrimination before they go off on their own. So all of these ideas are simply introduced. We're just planting a seed and trying to give the mentors tools so they can explore it further outside of the workshop. So now I'm going to move on to gender. So those were the main issues that I wanted to talk about with regard to race, ethnicity, and culture and where we stand in the mentoring literature. So as I mentioned, you know, all of these demographic diversity issues are areas that we don't really know much about. And, you know, the same with gender. We don't really know much in terms of how gender plays a role in mentoring relationships. So researchers in mentoring have drawn from some other literature with youth to look at how gender plays out in relationships overall. And some of the interesting things um, that researchers have looked at are things like friendship development. And what researchers have found is that girls' relationships are characterized with more intimacy, self-disclosure, more empathy compared to boys' relationships. And there is some research that suggests that race and class tends to, um, can influence you know, some of these differences as well. So for example, in a study done um, in 2001, white and black girls from middle class backgrounds were more likely to self-disclose to their peers compared to those who were from lower income backgrounds. So of course, race and class can also influence some of these uh, gender findings that, that people have looked at in these relationships. Also, help-seeking. Girls under times of stress, they're more likely to seek for emotional support compared to boys. 
uh, mentoring researchers have also looked at teacher-student relationships to try to understand adult-youth relationships. And what researchers find, um, well, the sh in general, the school system, there are more female teachers, so I'm sure that that influences the kind of relationships they have with their students. So that would be more applicable for the relationships with their uh, female mentor. And what researchers have found in teacher-student relationships is that teachers tend to prefer students with cooperative and responsive styles. Their relationships with females tend to be closer and have less conflict than their relationships with boys. Okay, so this suggests that mentors might form closer relationships with girls than with boys. Now, in mentoring itself, there has been research, a lot of the research in, in gender and mentoring that has been done is with adults and in career mentoring. And people find that there are differences between the type of support that male mentors provide and female mentors provide, and same with the kind of support that women and men seek. So what researchers have found is that men to, tend to provide more instrumental support. So that's a more... Um, uh, the type of support when you need to solve a problem, okay, to help the, the mentee achieve their goals. Then psychosocial support tends to be the kind of support that women tend to provide and that women seek. And this sense tends to be more process oriented. So this relies heavily on the interpersonal relationship between the mentor and the mentee and ultimately attempts to change the personal characteristics of the mentee. And some of the research on youth mentoring tends to suggest that some of this might apply to youth as well. So one set of researchers found that empathy, authenticity, and, rela and other relationship qualities were really important in relationships between female faculty and female college students, and that contributed to higher self-esteem and less loneliness. Rhodes, Jean Rhodes, who's done a lot of research on mentoring, she's found that girls tend to want their mentors to talk, whereas the boys want their mentors to do activities with them, which is consistent with this instrumental and psychosocial kind of support. Now, an interesting thing is that people have started to challenge that a little bit. A lot of times people think, well, boys aren't really interested in the emotional support. And Niobe Way, who's done a developmental psychologist, who's done longitudinal work with adolescents and their relationships, she's done work with adolescent boys, and she's found that some of the boys, they do have deep, multifaceted, emotionally connected relationships, and that those who didn't have that were actually yearning for those relationships. So people have started to ask, well, can we assume that boys don't want emotional, an emotional kind of connection with their mentor? And one researcher, uh, Renee Spencer, who's in uh, Boston, she's looked at the emotional closeness in male mentoring relationships between a male adult and a male youth. And she did a study where she interviewed 12 mentor-mentee pairs at a Big Brother, Big Sister program in the Northeast. And, he, and to be part of the study, you had to have been in your relationship for at least a year. And the staff deemed these relationships as being strong and, and significant relationships. And the youth, just to give you some background, the youth um, were diverse. There were, in this study, a few were white, some were African American, a few were biracial or multiracial. What they all had in common is they didn't have a father figure in the home. And the mentors were less diverse. They were mostly white and middle class. And what they found, or what she found, is that the mentors, some of the mentors talked about how they wanted to be models of emotional connection and emotional vulnerability. Some of the mentors talked about how when they were growing up, they didn't have an adult male who tried to be supportive at an emotional level with them. And they were trying to provide that themselves to, to a young person. Some of these relationships were characterized as close and enduring. The, when the youth and the mentors talked about their relationships, they said that the, the youth would talk about the mentors as being very caring. They would talk about trusting the mentor, that there would be emotional attachment in the relationship. One young person, he said in his interview, when he was asked, how long do you think this relationship would last, the young person said, until I have to go buy him adult diapers for an old folks home. So he saw this relationship lasting forever, okay? So these relationships were obviously very close. The 
they, they also characterize the relationship as being a safe space for vulnerability and emotional support. So the youth thought that the mentors would be there for them no matter what. If they had a problem, they could go to the mentor to talk to them about it. They, um, they felt that you know, they could trust them. One mentor talked about, though, how it took his mentee about two years to reveal some of the things that have been going on in his family. So it took a while. But what helped them get to this level for them to be close is that there was consistency in the relationship. So the, the mentors and the youth met every other week, and they, had, they would talk on the phone um, as well in between. But this, these mentors were very consistent, would follow through, and they had frequent interaction. And then that allowed them to develop these close relationships. Now, although these relationships, there, were emo there was emotional connection, and the mentors and youth would talk about it this way, when the adults, when the men talked about it, they'd always couch it under, well, I'm a man's man. We don't get, you know, emotional like that all the time. It's only once in a while. So they would always preface it, you know, with that. So there was definitely, um, you know, they would try to couch it under, you know, masculinity. Um, the, in the, it, the results, they talk about, this one adult, how when he was interviewed alone, he talked about how when he had gone away one time on vacation, he realized that he actually missed his mentee. And then after that, he was interviewed with the mentee, and the interviewer asked him to talk about what he had said. And he said, well, I don't want to sound corny, but you know, when I was away, I like talking to you. So he didn't say that he missed them, and he had to preface it, this sounds corny. So there is still, you know, um, it, it's not necessarily okay to just, you know, um, have that kind of um, emotional kind of relationship. But they acknowledge it, but there's a limit. Okay. Some of the research that's been done on youth mentoring when they've looked at gender, they find that the gender of the mentee is not necessarily related to whether or not a mentoring program is um, effective. And an interesting finding is that some uh, Grossman and Rhodes found that premature termination of a match, and this is with Big Brothers Big Sisters programs, they seem to be slightly more likely among female matches. So that's an interesting finding with regard to gender. And Jean Rhodes, she explains this by talking about referral, why girls are referred and boys are referred to Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or mentoring programs, and also uh, the role of gender in relationship formation. So although there's many exceptions, there's some evidence that, that girls are referred to, to mentoring programs because maybe there's problems in the mother-daughter relationship, whereas boys are referred to, these, to the programs because the parent is seeking a positive adult role model. So there isn't necessarily something wrong with maybe the mother and son relationship. And there's been some research that's found that maybe the trouble in the mother-daughter relationship, that, that there might actually be issues that's contributing to the mentoring relationship. In one national study of Big Brothers Big Sisters, they found that the girls, when they were initially referred to the program, they reported lower overall attachment to their parents. Usually it was the mom when they, when they would talk about the parent relationship. They also, talked about, they also had lower levels of parental trust and higher levels of alienation in the parent, parental relationship. So maybe these troubled relationships with the parent is being translated to the mentoring relationship and it's causing problems and it's making it harder for them to develop a close relationship and then that's why they might terminate early, which would influence their ability to develop you know, a close relationship with the mentor. Also, another thing that Jean Rhodes talks about is that if there is problems in the relationship between the girl and the mom, maybe the mom isn't giving the support to allow this relationship to happen. So maybe not giving a ride to BBBS when there's an activity going on and the mentor is going to be there. So maybe there are some concrete logistical things that um, are also affecting their ability to develop the relationship. Okay. And in the program that I mentioned in Girl Power, we also try to make this program gender specific since it's focused on girls. So we, um, as I mentioned, it targets African-American and Latina girls, so we, and we focus on strengthening the mentor-youth relationship. So we focus on the interpersonal aspect of the relationship, which, consistent with some of the 
literature that suggests that girls want some of this psychosocial support. So at every workshop, we start off the workshops with, the, with a mentor and youth doing a skit where there's some kind of relationship issue. And that way, you know, they can have a conversation as a group about what is a relationship issue, how can it be resolved, and this could, so could sort of plant a seed for the mentors and youth so if they were to experience something like this, they could figure out how to overcome that. We also provide opportunities for social connection. So by having this group format once a month, it allows the girls and the mentors to be able to develop relationships with other girls and other mentors. And some of the evaluation data suggests that the girls and the mentors really like this component of the program because they get to meet other women and girls and form meaningful relationships. Um, some people think also that the fact that we have in each of these workshops, it's a women girl only setting so maybe by having a female setting it allows for girls voices to be heard and they don't have to feel uncomfortable you know as if they might feel uncomfortable in a mixed gender setting and then also we focus on issues that are relevant to adolescent girls so some of our workshop topics are focused on the interpersonal relationships. So early on, we do a workshop about the mentor and youth relationship to help them get to know each other. We also do a workshop on social networks so that the mentor can learn the social network of the girls and understand who, who are the important individuals in your life, but also for the mentee to understand that there's other important adults in your life besides this mentor, whether it's a parent or other um, family members members or adults um, in their school system or another community agency who are important who they could go to for support. And as I mentioned, um, we focus on issues that might affect the health and well-being of girls. So for example, self-esteem at the interpersonal level when we talk about peer relationships, we'll talk about relationship aggression, which some researchers talk about how when there's aggression in female versus male relationships, it's much more relational among girls. At the societal level, we talk about pressures and stereotypes contributing to unhealthy diet or to body image and how girls see themselves. And throughout, we incorporate positive images of women and girls throughout the curriculum. And finally, we have uh, development and mentoring. So age, okay, so how does age play into all of this? And I'm sure all of these factors that I'm talking about, race, ethnicity, culture, and gender, and age, they're all interacting at once and influencing youth and their needs. So as I mentioned, you know, little is known about youth's development. There, as you read in that reading, there's very few programs that are focused solely or developed solely for children. And then if those that are focused on adolescents, they don't necessarily distinguish between younger adolescents and older adolescents and what are some of the differences. And um, one of the findings that people have found in this area is that youth aged 10 to 12 years are less likely to terminate mentoring relationships compared to older youth. So there might be something going on developmentally and maybe we're developing programs in a way that's not necessarily as developmentally friendly to older adolescents. Okay. There's, there's so that's what I just mentioned, that research finding. So there's many kinds of differences that we might find across, you know, adolescents. So there's cognitive and verbal abilities that we see vary between children and adolescents. So younger children, they have less verbal skills and they're less cognitively advanced. Cavell and Hughes, they developed a program, a mentoring program that was for children and they trained college students to do child-directed play with them. So they had them, you know, paraphrase comments that the child might make, describe any ongoing play activities, and they did all this to help the children learn how to express their emotions appropriately. Now something like that obviously would not work well, you know, with adolescents. Also, adolescents, you know, they have more of an ability to shape and manage the mentoring relationships. So maybe there's more termination issues with older adolescents because maybe they're the ones they are contributing to these relationships ending. So if they are not interested in the mentoring relationship, you know, they might be very resistant to the mentor, either by not showing up to activities or maybe making it intolerable for the mentor when they're interacting with them. Okay. 
And there's some research that suggests that there's a weak relationship between participating in mentoring programs and outcomes during the middle and late adolescence. So again, some developmental differences. So there's a stronger relationship between mentoring and outcomes for early adolescence. And early adolescence, that's a time where there's a lot of uh, changes, a lot of rapid changes, simultaneous changes that are going on. So maybe social support and the interpersonal aspect of mentoring is really important for this period. It might be that for older adolescents, maybe the emotional support is not as important as maybe instrumental support. So providing youth with maybe opportunities for, um, to learn new skills, for example. So maybe some of the older youth would like those kinds of things. So perhaps the types of activities and the social support varies by um, the developmental stage of, of these youth. Okay. But of course, you know, as I mentioned before with gender, you know, the females like the psychosocial type of support, whereas the males like the instrumental support. But then here with age, we're saying that those who are older might want instrumental support and those who are younger might want the psychosocial. So how does gender and age interact? And so it makes things a little bit more complicated. And here's an example of a developmentally specific mentoring program. And this is an apprenticeship program where adolescents are provided with mentorings in different work environments to expose them to the working world and what they can strive for in the future. And they get, each youth gets two types of mentors. The coordinators who supervise the adolescents' placements, they serve as mentors. And then also there's mentors who they work closely with in specific settings. And a lot of the activities between the mentors and youth are focused around introducing the youth to the social demands of work, such as teamwork, responsibility, and positive work attitudes. So maybe these kinds of, of mentoring programs are more helpful for those who, for the older adolescents. Okay. All right, so what are some of the take-home messages in terms of implications for practice? You know, when we look at race, ethnicity, culture, gender, and development. First of all, it's really important to train mentors and staff on youth needs around all of these issues, around race, ethnicity, culture, age, and gender. It's really important that we try to understand where are they coming from and what's important to them so that we can provide the best support that we can. It's important that program goals are specified. Oftentimes the goals of programs are broad, so it might be to help at-risk youth, but what is the goal in terms of how we want to help them? So are we trying to help them, you know, by providing more psychosocial support? And if so, might that be more appropriate for females or for younger youth? So really trying to specify how it is that we want to help youth and then thinking about what group that would help most or doing it the opposite. Think about what's your population and what's the best way to help them. Um, I think it would be important to consider using assessments to understand mentor and youth before matches are made and to target support. So if we know, for example, beforehand that a, that a particular youth has a high level of cultural mistrust, then that might influence who you match that you with, the youth with. Or if they are matched up with um, if it's a minority youth matched up with a white mentor, then maybe staff need to provide a lot more support in that relationship because it might be harder to develop a closer relationship. Um, it would be important to look at what are the interests and what are the preferences of youth and mentors. Do they want to be matched up with a particular adult, type of adult, or a particular youth? Oftentimes youth say, I just want a big brother, I just want a big sister, that's really what's more important. But we also want to look at where are they similar? Are they similar on interests or values so we can try to match you know, appropriately? Or maybe relationship styles. And finally, I think it would be important to take a look at termination issues. So maybe there is something that's going on programmatically or maybe it's something that's related to the, some of these, these diversity issues that I mentioned. Maybe the youth's needs weren't necessarily being met. Maybe it was a bad fit with the mentor and maybe there are some cultural issues that haven't been considered in the program. So by understanding why it is these relationships are not succeeding, maybe we can learn from those and apply them to other, prog to other relationships so that we can have successful relationships. 
All right, thank you very much. Thank you.